chapter number 18, very, very uh, common, uh, I say common, but we've probably heard this particular text many times, uh, nothing new in particular, but then again, King Solomon said there's no new thing under the sun, amen, that which is, is that which was, amen, how many people glad to be in the house of God today, amen, I'm glad, amen, if you're not glad, I'm doubly glad for us, I'll, I'll take up the slack there with my gladness. Could have been a lot of places, but God blessed us to be here. First Kings chapter number 18, verse number 17, a little bit of reading today, but not too much. Uh, verse number 17, we're going to read down to verse number 21. Is everybody OK with that? A few verses. All right. Let us read together. And it says what? And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said unto him, art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and has followed Balaam. Now therefore send and gather to me all of Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal four hundred and fifty, and the prophets of the groves four hundred, which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab went Unto, sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Balaam, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Pray with me that the Lord will bless this uh, message today and the people that are in this congregation and in this church. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for those who have gathered together to hear your word. We know that the word of God is precious and we know that there are times that are going to come. We're going to want to hear the word of God and may not be able to hear it. Bless us today that we'll receive what you will have us to receive. Visit us, Lord, in your demonstration of power and glory, that we will know that you are still God and sit upon the throne. And we give you the praise and glory for that. Let everybody say in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. 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 You may be seated in Jesus' precious, wonderful, matchless name. Amen. I'd like to just use for a message just for the day a subject coming from verse number 21. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, how long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. I'd like to use for a subject today, make up your mind. Make up your mind. I don't know about you, but I, 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 uh, I've always believed this, and I've read it in many books, and I've seen people in action with it, and, uh, or in action, and I believe that one of the worst things that a person can do, particularly a leader, is to not be able to make a decision. Uh, everybody, sooner or later in their lifetime, is going to make a wrong decision. Okay. But when you can't make a decision, when you spend too much time vacillating, it's dangerous. Yes. Yes, it is. I'm, even, I'm even under the, the, the thought that it's probably better in some cases that if I make a decision and it's wrong, to do that than to not make a decision. How many times have you been going on the freeway and you're getting behind somebody and it just, they just don't seem like they want to get on the freeway? Has anybody ever seen that? <laughs> They're moving slowly. The car's kind of They, they kind of want to go into the traffic. They don't. And you're coming up on them. You say, come on, people, move, move, move. Get, get in there. You know, and I know what it is. Sometimes they're afraid that they're going to cause an accident or whatever the case may be. But in that moment of indecision, there is more danger, it seems like, of them causing an accident than if they just put the pedal to the metal and get moving. When it is that we can't make up our mind about something, it's very, very hard for us to move forward. Elijah, the prophet, we probably know about him from much reading. Elijah was uh, one of the prophets who, who the Bible tells us he, he came in that spirit of power and might. And we know he had a lot of miracles going on, a lot of different things. 
And there came a time when there had to be a showdown with the people of Baal. Uh, how many people know that God is bringing you to the valley of decision? I'd like to even call this place where they were at. I don't know what the, these Carmel, they call it Carmel. I'm going to call it the place of decision. Amen. Because there had to be a decision made. Uh, this is one of the greatest showdowns that I've ever read about in the history of the Bible. And where the man of God uh, had prayed and there wasn't any rain and, and people were, were, were starving and the animals were starving because the rain stopped for three and a half years. The book of James tells us that, that Elijah was a man of like passions like you and me, just a human being. But he prayed and asked God, don't send any rain. And it didn't rain for three and a half years. Now, the whole purpose of that was for Elijah to, to show the people in the, that he was dealing with that God was still in control and that he was serving the one true God. Somebody say the true God. So Elijah had brought it to the point where after three and a half years before it was going to rain, he said, okay, now it's time for a showdown. I'm going to, this is time for us to come to a head. Uh, I want to tell you this, if those of you who are sitting, somebody in this church is sitting at a point of decision and you are not able to make the decision to go this way or that way. And I want to tell you that God does not want you to stay in that valley. I want to tell you that God wants you to make a decision about what you're going to do. So he gives us this story here, and he starts out with this. Hey, I know you have prophets of Baal. Bring them all. Bring everyone you can find, Elijah says, uh, those people who were eating at Jezebel's table. And we all know that Jezebel was a wicked woman, and she had a lot of power and control. She was the queen of King Ahab. But the Bible says that he went and found all of these prophets, and he brought them to this valley. So before the showdown even started, Elijah says, how long will you halt between two opinions? Uh -huh. Now, we have to understand when he gives them that, that, that question that there is a lot in that question. Okay, when we start thinking about uh, what he's saying to them, we have to examine the word halt. And from my first thought, I want you to remember this. Indecision always hinders progress. When you can't make up your mind, you can't progress. Even if it's a, you might have two bank robbers who decide they're going to rob a bank. Sooner or later, they've got to make a decision about that. And even though it's the wrong thing for them to do, even though it might be a crime and all this good stuff, if they're not going to be, even be anywhere successful if they don't make up their mind. You have to make a decision. So Elijah says to the people, how long will you halt between two opinions? Now, Ed, when you look at the word halt, the word halt can have a number of uh, definitions in the Bible. One of those definitions is, has to do with somebody being lame. You'll read that in the Bible in a number of cases. Somebody was halt on their feet or they couldn't move very good, so that meant lame. But in this particular context, the word halt means to pause or to hesitate, and it can even mean to terminate. Now, I want you to think about that. To pause or to hesitate, kind of like those people getting on the freeway we were talking about. They want to, but then they don't really want to. They know they should, but they're afraid to. There are people in the world, and there may be some in this audience today, I believe there is, that really knows that they want to move with God. They are questioning in their mind, why should I follow God? Why should I go from here to there? And the Bible says that it is important for us to make a decision. So Elijah goes and he begins to talk to the prophets of Baal and he asks them, how long will you do this? How long are you going to stay in this place? Yeah, have you ever heard anybody say this? Either lead or follow or get out of the way. Yeah. Have you heard that? Yeah. I've heard that saying and it's a very good one. Because sometimes people don't know what they want to do, whether they want to lead or follow. Or, or sometimes they just sit in the way and do nothing. Uh, we hear people say sometimes, well, pastor, I've been, I've been in church a long time. I've been around for 40 years. Some of those years, some people have just been in the way. Because they haven't really made a decision to really follow God. And we don't want that. And Elijah said to the people, you've got to make a decision about what you're going to do. You've got to decide. Now, the word decision is a very important word because it has a couple of meanings to it as well. And when you break that word down and get it into the Greek of what it means, it really means to break away from and put away. Two words combined means to break away and put away. In other words, you're going to break away from the thinking that you currently have. And then you're going to put away anything that's going to keep you from doing what you've decided to do. How many have made a decision to do something in your life? Amen. Amen. A few people. 
But there are a number of people in here, I'm sure that you know what it's like to make a decision. Sometimes when you make that decision, as soon as you make it, trouble comes. As soon as you say, I'm going to, and get started, something happens. Take fasting, for example. <laughs> How many people have said, I'm going to fast, and as soon as you... <laughs> now, you could go all day long and not eat a drop, not even drink a cup of water, and you're just happy, go lucky, doing what you want to do. But the moment you say, I'm going to fast, man, the scrambled eggs never smelled so good. <laughs> Bacon didn't, it didn't smell so good. I mean, man, it's just amazing how it is when you say you're going to fast. And then you'll go to work that day, and what's somebody going to do? They'll bring pizza. And it'll be the person that never brings anything. <laughs> and they say, I'm going to bring some pizza. Now, don't, don't raise your hand, but I've been here too. How, how many times have, I, have you said, I'm going to fast for X number of days? You make it through one day. Sometimes you make it through half a day. I've been there. I've done that. I know what that's like. Why? But here's what the bottom line is. But I have also been on, on fast where I said to myself, I'm going to make it through this fast if I die trying. And because I'm still standing in front of you, it means I didn't die. And I made it through the fast. What happened there? I made a decision. I promised myself that I wasn't going to give up. I promise myself that no matter what happens, I won't eat a drop of food until this time, until I tell my body, now it's time for you to eat. That is what it is to make up your mind. Amen. And Elijah said to these people, listen, you're vacillating between two opinions. Now, this, this text makes me think that these people really weren't on board with Jezebel. They really didn't, re they may not have really been on board, but because she had so much power, they might have been afraid that they were going to die. Because you remember the story, Elijah, even after he did the great big test and everything, God sucked up the water and all that, he went into a cave because uh, Jezebel sent him a letter. And she said, hey, I want to do the same thing to you that you did to all the prophets of Baal. I'm going to do that by tomorrow. And that put fear in him, and away he went to a cave to hide out. So they may not have been in a mind frame to say, I'm all in with the devil. Can I help somebody right here? Some people are living in sin and they're not really all with it. Uh -huh, that's right. Hello, somebody. Amen. Some people get in trouble because they go along with a friend or a bunch of people and they do what other people want them to do. But they really are not sold out to what they're doing. Amen. Have you ever noticed that? Uh -huh. Then there are people in the house of God that's in the same boat. This is sad. There are people who show up to church week after week, and they're really not in it. That's right. There are people who talk about God a great deal, and they're really not in. They have one foot planted on the outside, and the other foot planted on the inside. And these people are really not at the point of making up their mind. And Elijah said, I don't want you to be that way. I need you to make up your mind. Make a decision for the Lord or not. I remember reading the scripture. Somebody it says in Psalms chapter 34, verse number eight, I think it is. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Sometimes we need a sample, don't we? Yeah. This is what we hope you get when you come to church is that when you come into the house of God, this is why we pray so much for people that when they come in, that you can feel the presence of the living God, that you can come into the church and not and not just go out the same way you came. We want you to come in and get an experience. Amen. So that you can feel that there is a real God. We want you to walk in and get something that's going to help you make your mind up. We want you to come in and see somebody delivered from a, with a miracle that God does a miracle for somebody before your eyes. We need the demonstration and the power of the Holy Ghost. It's not just about us singing songs and lifting up him but it's about God moving in the midst of his people it's about letting God move to the point that he demonstrates to somebody and gives them a taste of glory so they can know there is a God Hallelujah. why because there's too many people standing on the precipice of indecision Amen. I want somebody to leave here today saying I have made up my mind I have made, I, we used to sing a song, I don't know if they sing it anymore, I, I think it was a hymn though. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. Then they would say this, no turning back, 
no turning back. We used to sing that all the time when I was a kid. I've decided to follow Jesus. What does that mean? I've made up my mind. If I lose my friends, I've lost them. If I lose my mother, I've lost her. If I lose my job, I've lost it. If I lose my income, I've lost it. If I lose the people that are my friends, so be it. But Brother Bacon has decided, I'm going to follow Jesus all the way. And when I've made that decision, I broke away from everything else that, that would hinder me from following him. Elijah said, make up your mind. How long will you halt between two opinions? We read in James chapter 1. You can read this at your leisure. James chapter 1, verses number 4 through 8. James begins to talk about to asking God for things. And he says, when that person begins to ask God, don't ask doubting. But let him ask with faith. You have probably read that. And let him ask with faith. Because he that does not uh, ask with faith is like a wave that's tossed and driven. He's wavering all the time. Then he goes on down in a couple more verses. I think this is actually verse 8 where he says, a double-minded person uh, is unstable in all his ways. Now, maybe you guys didn't do this when you were in elementary school, but I did. You got you, you somebody you like and you pick a flower off the thing and you're trying to figure out if that person likes you or not. She loves me. She loves me. <laughs> I used to do that too. And I would always kind of count those flowers to see, am I going to land on, you know. And then, and then when I didn't land on, she loves me, I throw that flower away and get another one. Why, you want to know, don't you? <laughs> Nobody wants somebody that they're married to that you think they love you. God wants somebody that's going to be committed to him. He wants somebody who says, I've had enough of the world. I've had enough of the way people treat me. I'm going to change my management, and I'm going to get over to God's side. He wants somebody who has a made-up mind. He wants somebody who's decided that I won't live this way anymore. I'm not going to stand in the valley of indecision any longer. I'm going to choose a side and begin to work that thing. I want you to know that God brought you here today, that just in case you have not made up your mind, that this is the time for you to make a great decision, that will impact the rest of your life. Amen. Amen. Make up your mind. Amen. I often tell this story. My wife doesn't like me to, but I'll tell it anyway. I often talk about how my wife and I was going to lunch one time, and she couldn't make up her mind where she wanted to eat. I said, how about McDonald's? I don't like McDonald's. I don't want that. I said, okay, baby, let's stop at this. Oh, the hot dog stand. Remember that hot dog stand? They had great hot dogs. I still can't understand why she wouldn't pick that. I said, great, let's stop at the hot dog. I don't have a taste for hot dogs. Oh, we're passing by the Italian restaurant. Are they going to make some great Italian sandwiches? No. <laughs> we're, dry, we're running out of restaurants because it's a small town. <laughs> I said, babe, we got to go eat somewhere. We only got an hour. Ah, oh, let's forget it. I'll, we'll just go home. No problem. We went home. But after we were home and getting ready to go back to work, then she said, I want to stop at Jack in the Box. <laughs> that didn't turn out too good. That was a, that was a bad day for us both. <laughs> I couldn't believe that on all that. You, you want to go to Jack in the Box? <laughs> when you can't make up your mind, it's frustrating, isn't it? But man, when you make a decision to do something, it's amazing how it is when you have made up your mind. One thing I do is I try my best that when I decide I want to really do something, I try to put everything around me that I can that reminds me, Roy, you said you were going to do that. You've got to really want this. You've got to desire, ha have a desire for it. You've got to put away other things. You've got to turn somebody down if you're going to do this. You've got to put some other things away if you're going to do that. You've got to move that out of the way if you're going to do that because it's going to stop you from accomplishing your goal. This is exactly what Elijah was trying to tell the people. You've got to make up your mind. You're bouncing all over the place between two opinions. Make a decision of who you're going to follow and follow them. If it's God, if he be God, then follow him. Baal was one of the gods they worshipped. Uh, the devil worshipping uh, uh, came in with Baal and Astaroth. They were one of the idols that people worshipped. They believed that he was the supreme god and one of the supreme gods. And they began to bow down to him, make images, and do all sorts of things. And you all know the story probably just as well as I do. How Elijah said, okay, call on your god. Begin to call on him and see if he's going to answer. And they begin, the Bible said they begin to cut themselves and do all kinds of strange things trying to conjure up their god. And he never answered. But he said, I tell you what, my god's going to answer by fire. He's going to answer this and he's going to suck up all of the things that we have down here. And he's going to demonstrate to you that he is the God of God. 
See, this is what I like about God. I love that, that God will able, is able to come into the midst of his people and answer by a move of the Holy Ghost. See, it's one thing to be able to say, I know God just because I read it in a page. But when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, yes, yes, yes. there's nothing like it. Amen. Man, oh man. Amen. You t- not, he doesn't give you just a taste. He gives you the meal. Yes. He gives you the meal. Why? Because he wants you to make up your mind. Yes. Somebody in the audience today may be saying, Brother Bacon, I've been thinking about serving God. But I haven't made a decision yet. I know what you mean. I went to church years ago with my wife. She wasn't my wife at the time. I had just met her a little while before that. And we decided to go to a revival together. You might remember that. She was in church and they, they talked her into coming up front and she was crying. Oh, I, got, I said, oh man, I got to get out of here. These people, these people are crazy. <laughs> now mind you, <laughs> mind you, I was, I was I, in my mind before I even went to church that night, I said, Lord, you know, I do need to be saved. I know, I know I'm not living a good life. I'm not living right and I need to be saved. See, isn't it amazing how sometimes we know we're not doing right and we still won't do the right thing when God calls us? I knew I wasn't doing the right thing. And while my wife was in there, they were baptizing her or something. I, I sat outside on this little rose bush thing they had with some bricks around it. And I was just kind of talking to God to myself and, and everything. And as I was talking to God, I told God, I said, you know, I, I, I know that I'm running from you. I know I am. Uh, but, but I just and I want to be do the right thing. Uh, but I don't want to I don't want to fall into some cult or something that's not right. Now, now think about that. Here I am talking to God about falling into a cult. I'm a sinner among sinners, first of all. I didn't know anything about the Bible in terms of reading the Bible for real. And here I'm telling God, I don't want to fall into a cult. Well, when you're in the place of indecision, you're already in one. That's just as bad. But, you know, I was was 21 years old, so I figured, you know, that was a good rationale. (laughs) So I I thought it was. So when I was talking to God, I said, "I, I, I just don't want this to be the wrong thing. Somebody came out to church. I think it was one of the ministers, Jones. You might remember Brother Jones. Jones came out of church and he said, Brother, are you going to continue to wait? Or are you going to come and get baptized? He put me on the spot. Are you going to continue to wait? I say that to somebody today in this church. Are you going to continue to wait? Are you going to continue in the place that you are, knowing that you're not where God wants you to be? Or are you going to step up to the plate and make a decision? Yes, yes, yes. And make up your mind for good. I love the scriptures that teach us that making up your mind is important. God gave us Genesis chapter 19. You can read this at your leisure. He went and he sent to an angel to rescue Lot out of the sinful city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Everybody knows that story, right? By the way, let me help somebody with that. I don't care if the whole city, I do care, but I don't. If the whole city is given to sin and you are the only person saved in the city, God's going to rescue you. Amen. That's one of the benefits of having a made up mind for God. Solomon Gomorrah was probably as bad as it could be. But God had a man there and he called him righteous Lot. Because he was vexed, hear what I'm saying, by the things that were going on in the city about the people. And he sat at the gate and God sent two angels to him and tell him, I want to get you out of this city because God's going to destroy this place. And if you read down, I don't have time to go through the whole story. But around verse number 16, you will hear the angels talking to Lot, 15 and 16, telling him, hey, go get your stuff. We got to get moving. We got to get out of here. And the scripture says, and while he yet lingered. Now get this. Here the man is in a city that he knows is given to much sin. He knows it's a bad place. He knows he doesn't like it. But when the rescue came, he lingered in making up his mind. And the scripture says the angel had to take hold of his hand and pull him out so that he can get out of the city. Why do I bring that story up? Let me tell you what's going to happen. I just talked about fasting. As soon as you say I'm going to make up my mind for God, Something's going to take place in your life that's going to try to hinder you. Somebody's going to say, what about my parents? I've had people ask me that. Or Brother Bacon, what about my parents and my cousins and my, my friends? And what about the people that I know? And here's what I think happens to a lot of people. They begin to think about those relationships that they're going to have to sever ties with. 
They begin to think about people, how they're going to talk about them, that you left us and you used to be one of us and you're no longer one of us anymore. That's right. That's right. They begin to think, I know what I'm saying because I, I've, I've been there. They're going to begin to think about that. I remember telling the Lord one day when I knew he was talking to my heart that maybe I would get saved if I had some friends who were saved. My wife and I were just talking about this the other day. I remember 30 something years ago saying that to God, that maybe if I had some friends that were saved, it wouldn't be such a big deal. And then one night I was walking from church, my wife and I, a couple of other saints from church. We'd all been there, all been saved within the last six months or so. And the spirit of the Lord spoke into my heart. Now you have the friends. What are you going to do? I'll never forget that. A cold chill went down my spine as I stopped and we were walking because I felt God say that to my heart. You, now you have the friends. What are you going to do now? Now, some of those friends are no longer saved. But God brought me to a point of decision so that I can make up my mind. And I told the Lord that if you'll keep me in this way and you'll show me what the word of God says, I'll stay. I begin to read the Bible like it was the last thing on the planet Earth. I read and I studied. I wanted to understand what God was saying to me. Let me tell you something. When you make up your mind, you've got to jump into this thing wholeheartedly. You've got to put your feet on the ground and tell God you're going to do what he asked you to do. You've got to be committed to it. You've got to go all in when you make up your mind. But the first step is to decide, I want the Lord. I don't want what I have anymore. I want what God has for me you got to make up your mind for that nobody can do this for you Elijah no matter how great of a prophet he was could have made up the mind of those people you have to make up your own mind I guarantee you this so let me help some of you as you come to that decision because there's going to be some pain down the road that you need to be aware of some people in your family are never going to accept your change. That's right. That's right. They're never going to accept that. In fact, hold on to your seats because some of you don't want to believe this. Some of your closest friends and relatives will become agents for the devil. And they will do everything they can to undermine your walk with God. You have to understand that this is how it works so that you don't begin to hate them. You know that they are under the influence of the evil one. Yes, yes, yes. When Jesus was on his way to Calvary, he said, I'm going to Jerusalem. And Peter said, Lord, no, be it, be it far from you to do such a thing. And Jesus turned on a dime and said, and rebuke the devil. Yes. Now, Peter was the one who opened his mouth. But Jesus knew that there was a spirit there which caused Peter to speak. So that he could try to hinder God from doing what he needed to do through the cross. If the enemy will intercept the man of God, if the enemy will intercept the prophet, if the enemy will intercept somebody like Peter who was a disciple of the Lord, he is going to do the same thing to you and me. But you still have to make up your mind. When you're between two opinions, you're double minded. I want to be saved. I don't. How many people have, have met people who are very, very moody? Anybody ever met somebody like that? You don't know when they come in and you see them one day if they're going to be happy, if they're going to be sad that day. It's just a toss up, isn't it? One day they're so nice. You just man, what, what happened to that other person that was so evil yesterday? <laughs> and then they come sometimes and, and you look at their face you, and you want to say good morning, but you dare not. <laughs> right? They're moody. They, it, it just happens. And some people are like that every, every other day. You just don't know when the wind's going to blow and how they're going to be. But you love the person that's consistent, don't you? Yeah. Even if the person is consistently moody. <laughs> well, you know, really, if a person is consistently like that and they just have a sour disposition, let's say between 8 o'clock and 10 o'clock in the morning. And some people do. So they get that coffee in them and all that kind of stuff. Then they kind of perk up. You can deal with that because you can go do something else between 8 and 10. <laughs> and then you can come talk to them and say, oh, hi. And then, oh, so, so much nicer. It's good to see you too, right? See, even when someone is moody and consistent, you can live with that. You know what God wants? He wants consistency. 
He wants somebody that's going to make up their mind and say, God, you know what? I'm tired of bouncing back and forth. There's some people in this audience right here. That, and some of you, I'm going to just say this. I don't, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. But you, I have talked to some of you in here and you still haven't made up your mind. And some of you know you need to make your mind up and you haven't done it yet. I want to tell you that you're living on borrowed time. You're living in a space and God is giving you an opportunity to come to the decision because there's going to come a time when you won't have time anymore. This is why we preach the way we preach. This is why we teach the way we teach, because none of us have an infinite amount of time. And none of us know when it's going to be our last day. Just the other day, I received a text message from one of the pastors here in the city. Uh, Another pastor that we both know lost his brother-in-law. And he sent out a text and asked her to pray for the family. And I was thinking, and he explained the whole situation. The, the guy was driving somewhere in Tennessee on an a, a 18-wheeler, and somebody either pulled out in front of him, and he tried to dodge those people, and there was a big wreck ha- happened, and his brother-in-law was killed instantly in the whole thing, and a uh, very, very sorrowful uh, uh, occasion. And I thought to myself, my wife and I, I think we were talking about that, how none of us know when God's going to say, your time's up. But when we have a made-up mind, To follow Jesus, it's not going to really matter. Hear what I'm telling you. We've got to be prepared. We prepare to go on vacation. We prepare by buying insurance for our cars. We got insurance for our houses. We have insurance, burial insurance. Don't we? If we're going to go on vacation next week, everybody, we'd be all prepared. Now, what do I need to take? What do I need to get? I need to go. Oh, I'm going to call so-and-so. I'm going to go by to see so-and-so when I get down there. We, we prepare for that. But we don't do that when it comes to our salvation. When it comes to where we're going to live in eternity. We allow the circumstances of the world to keep us in a place of indecision. How long will you halt between two opinions? Will you stop the progress? How long will you stay where you are and not making any advancements toward God? I don't want a soul in this church to ever say that we did not have an opportunity to make that choice. Today, the Bible says that you hear my voice. Harden not your heart. This is the time for you to make a decision. If there is anybody in this church who has not made that decision, this message is for you. This message is for you directly at your heart, directly at your mind to examine where you are and say to yourself, am I going to serve God or am I going to keep living like this? Now, let me throw this in before I I end this message, because it's true and it's not going to sound pretty. Some people are going to say to you, just because you're not serving God, it doesn't mean you're serving the devil. That's wrong. That's wrong. Your decision or indecision means that you have decided to stay where you are. And if that is not with God, then you are certainly under the influence of something. Amen. We hear all the time, I'm marching to my my own drum, the, the beat of my own drum. No, 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 you're not. No, you're not. You're marching to somebody's beat. And if that is not God's, The only other choices is the devil. He is influencing and motivating and moving in and out of people's lives and allowing them to think that they're calling the shots. When the truth of the matter is, he's calling the shots. So do not be fooled by that. Run to God and make up your mind that you're going to live for him and follow him. When Lot was going out of that city in Genesis chapter 19, the Bible says his wife was with him and his two daughters. And the angels gave him specific instructions. Escape to the hills 